Good morning. Uh, welcome to the York County Sheriff's Office, Moss Justice Center. Um, my name is Trent Ferris. I'm the Public Information Officer for the York County Sheriff's Office. Um, today, the reason for our press conference today is to discuss our internal investigation findings regarding the in-custody death of Joshua M. Gross. Um, the York County Sheriff's Office has concluded our internal investigation, which occurred back on October 20th of 2013. Sheriff Bruce Bryant and uh, other members of the staff are here to answer your questions uh, about that. Uh, the ten detention center policies regarding the use of force and restraints will also be discussed as well as recent allegations made about another inmate death uh, in 2006. Um, video will not be uh, released. It will be shown um, at one point. You'll be asked to turn your cameras around or put them on the floor. You can still record audio, but you cannot video the uh, video we're about to show you. Uh, also, I ask that you will put your cell phones out on a table so you don't use those as a recording device as well. Um, right now, I'm gonna introduce the folks here in the room. To my right is Sheriff Bruce Bryant. This is our staff attorney, Chris Jordan, K-R-S, K-R-I-S Jordan. Uh, John Hicks, Sergeant John Hicks, he is our um, trainer, um, instructor for the detention center. We also have Chief Freddie Arwood and Assistant Chief Richie Martin. And now I'm going to ask uh, Sheriff Bruce Bryant to come up for some short remarks. Thank you, Trent. And I, and I would like to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, this is, is, of course, very unusual circumstances. Uh, and it's very, very unfortunate. You know, we take, take this whole operation to heart. Uh, what goes on here affects all of us. It affects all of our employees. And let me say this, first and foremost, we're not here to punish anyone. That's not our job, and that's not the mission of this organization. We are very compassionate. We're as compassionate to inmates as we possibly can be. Uh, we treat them with dignity and respect, but there are certain things that we have to do sometimes when things are not going uh, normal. And I think after uh, you watch this video today or you uh, have a chance to answer questions and, and what have you, I hope that you will understand and I hope that you will understand uh, what these officers must have gone through that particular night uh, of this incident. Uh, again, we do what we have to do to, to make sure that our inmates are kept safe and that our officers are kept safe. Uh, the last thing that we want to do is for an officer to be hurt or an inmate to be hurt. And you will see by this video just how compassionate some of these officers are, these officers are, and what, what all that happens that, and, and of course, you know, you can do things uh, in particular ways and you do things what you think is right. And of course, you know, sometimes we're questioned as, as to why we do things. And that's the, basically the reason we're here today. And that being said, I'm gonna turn everything over to my staff attorney, Chris Jordan. And uh, I'm gonna probably be in and out because I think this is gonna be right lengthy uh, and I've got some other things that I've got to deal with, but uh, I will be back in case somebody wants to talk to me or, or ask questions of me. And I may, I'm just gonna see how it goes. I got my, my sure. phone. What, under what grounds are you withholding the video? Under what? My staff attorney will explain that. Okay, and you will answer questions. I'll answer, I'll answer questions. Uh, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you I'm gonna answer questions. There's a lot to be, finished on this particular investigation. Again, we're giving you internal, the internal part of this investigation. The, the, as far as criminal investigation, that's being handled by the state law enforcement. You're not gonna answer any questions? I it's didn't say I was gonna ask, answer ask questions. We're have a time for questions. It'll be, a, it'll be a time. This is gonna be a lengthy process. And, and the sheriff will answer the question. I'll answer questions unless I want a staff attorney to answer. These are part of, of my organization. And sometimes other people in this organization 
can answer questions a whole lot better than I can. And that's when I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to point that person out. And it may be Richie, Freddie, it may be whoever. Okay? Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thanks, Sheriff. Again, I know everybody gets nervous when the attorney walks up. Um, I wear a lot of hats here at the Sheriff's Office and, and with the Detention Center. I'm involved in a lot of the processes. I, I uh, assist with reviewing investigations. Sometimes there may be information that I don't think is in there that I think is necessary. So I will ask that that, that be done. And so I take a very active role um, at Sheriff Bryant's request um, to assist with these things. Uh, in addition, as I'm sure you know, agencies get sued. You know, we're not going to sugarcoat that. People like to sue government entities. And so while we want to be as open and transparent as we can, um, we also um, have to be cognizant of statements that we make. And um, so what we want to make sure of is that everything we say is accurate, 100 percent accurate and correct. Um, because of the nature of this incident, people I'm sure want to ask questions. They want to question what law enforcement does. And then and that's their right to do that. But what we've hoped to what we hope to accomplish in part by calling you together in this way is to uh, educate you a little bit about what we deal with every day, uh, why sometimes things that you may see uh, in your normal everyday course of, of life may not appear to be appropriate. However, when I think when you can uh, take a look at exactly what our staff deals with every day and what their responsibilities are and what tools they have at their um, at, at the ready, I think you will understand um, much more clearly and be able to give a much more accurate and full uh, description of activities that take place here at the Sheriff's Office and at the Detention Center. So uh, that being said, again, we want to reiterate, we're coming back to you just as the Sheriff promised. He promised when he was in here for the media open house a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who were present, you heard that, recorded that. Um, it's never been his intent to hold off and not give any answers or let the public know uh, what occurred here in the detention center. Uh, typically, when we have these types of investigations, we don't like to come forward until all the information is available. Anyone who knows how to conduct a proper investigation knows that sometimes you have to hold off on stories, hold off on answers, uh, when you don't have all the information. So it's always our intent to make sure that not only our, inter our internal investigation is concluded, but also that all other pending investigations are concluded. Uh, a big part of that is we want to make sure we don't miss anything. We want to make sure that we are, again, complete. Um, we are coming forward today uh, because of a lot of questions and because of the toll it's taking on a lot of our staff. Um, our staff is being questioned or their, their um, motives and actions are being questioned and uh, it's taking a toll on them. And so we wanted to go ahead and not take any more time uh, so that we can allay uh, some of the allegations that have been made and also just to give you the information that, that you need. Obviously the public wants to know what happened in the detention center. Um, at this time currently the criminal investigation is still ongoing with regard to the crimes that actually occurred on the evening of October the 18th. You may wonder why because the uh, person that was charged with those crimes has, uh, is, is no longer available to be prosecuted. Well, while we're talking about the death of Joshua Gross, we also have to be mindful that there are families out there right now who are dealing with the questions and the concerns, um, the unanswered questions, to the bizarre set of facts that happened on October the 18th. Um, these family members uh, need closure. 
and they need answers. And so regardless of the fact that there will be no, uh, no, um, invest, no prosecution, we want to make sure that we have as accurate a picture as we possibly can of a very puzzling incident that occurred. So uh, that is ongoing. The detectives are continuing with that. They're having assistance by other agencies to try to map out what happened and try to piece it together as best they can. Um, in addition, the um, autopsy findings, that report has not been completed. Uh, it's my understanding that um, that probably won't be re uh, completed for a few weeks, uh, maybe a couple weeks. Um, that report will then go to the coroner who will have to determine and report cause and manner of death. She's given a preliminary uh, ruling of blunt force trauma as, as the reason for Mr. Gross's death. However, the manner of death has not yet been determined. Once that is concluded, that will go to SLED, who is conducting the criminal investigation uh, to determine whether or not anything criminal happened here in the detention center with regard to the death of Mr. Gross. Um, once all of that is compiled then into SLED's investigation, they will conclude their report and turn that over to the solicitor. So it's very possible that it could take, you know, three to four or six weeks before all that's concluded. Because we have what we believe is a full and complete picture of what happened that night, um, we feel comfortable going ahead and trying to give some closure to some of these uh, allegations that are going on and also just to let the public know how this inmate um, died in the facility. Um, we feel confident that once those um, findings are made by the solicitor and SLED and, and the coroner that that will be uh, consistent with what we've determined has, has occurred. We feel confident that, that it will um, be consistent with what um, you'll see today. Uh, with regard to our findings on the investigation, uh, we have determined that the actions taken by detention officers with regard to Mr. Gross were not only within our policy guidelines regarding use of force and use of restraints, but that the actions by our detention officers exemplify the behavior that the sheriff ex expects with regard to the treatment of detainees in our facility. Uh, in addition, they used ingenuity to try to protect Mr. Gross from his self-destructive behavior. Before I go into the particulars of that night, I'd like to just lay a little groundwork here so that we're all clear on what, um, what the climate is here within the detention center facility. Uh, and I apologize as far as the length of this goes, but we want to make sure that we give a full and accurate picture. We'll try to, we've got a lot of video. We're going to show a portion that shows the incident. We have video available of all the hours that he was in the detention center, and we can make that available for viewing. Um, with regard to video uh, and a detention center, we have a and the utmost requirement to provide for a safe environment. Um, to do that, uh, it's very important that the um, detention center remains as, uh, trying to think of the right word to use for it, it's, it's very important that we maintain the security within that facility. Some video, um, would show door entrances. Uh, releasing video can show officers' um, habits, the way they, um, or routines, I should say, as opposed to habits. Um, but their routines in checking, checking doors, uh, making security checks, where they go in, where they come out of, how we actually deal with an inmate um, when they're in a combative mode. That creates a security risk. Um, because once that video is out there, we don't have any control over where that video goes. And, and in this age, this day and age, some of you are uh, relaying information as we speak, you know. So uh, there's YouTube. Once we know that anything is on the internet, it is there forever. 
Uh, it is there forever for Joe Citizen, who has no intention of causing any problems. And it's also there for any potential new inmate or an inmate who's been in before and will probably be in again, um, or, or could possibly be in again. And um, seeing how our officers respond, how they, um, how a, a chair is used, any kind of use of force is used can create a security risk. And, uh, excuse me just a moment. We believe that we, by making this available for you to view, we are allowing you to, to see exactly what occurred, uh, but yet it would allow us to maintain that security um, that is so vital in, in um, what we do. Um, we have an average daily population of 388 inmates and we book an average of 168.7 um, persons a week, okay? So our facility is always in flux, people coming and going, and we have a significant amount of, of detainees at any one time in our facility. Jails are required to meet what is called minimum standards for jails and detention facilities. We meet all of those standards and we, um, in many instances, exceed minimum standards. When de detainees come in, they are provided with a handbook. And in that handbook, it lays out information on uh, you know, how, many, how, much uniforms that, how many uniforms they get, what they can have in their cell. It, it's provided to give them the information they need to successfully function within the detention center. As part of that, they're also given specific guides and guidelines and rules. And then there are specific consequences with regard to those rules, uh, infractions of those rules. Uh, at no time is a use of force or a use of restraint as defined by our policy used as a punishment. To do so would result in an officer being disciplined and could result in termination. Uh, and I, I think it's ironic that the sheriff used the exact words that I was going to quote him on uh, in my notes here. The sheriff always says that our job is not to punish or reward. He said it ever since I've been there, ever since I've been here. That's the job of the courts. Uh, and that is our overall guide, guiding principle here at the detention center. You have to understand as well, we don't choose our inmates. Our inmates come into the facility with their own histories, their own uh, prior engagements with law enforcement, their prior uh, family histories, family dynamics, uh, economic woes. They come, in, they come in our doors with the same things that all of us face every day. They also come in with mental health issues and they come in with medical issues. Uh, I think that um, it's pretty common or pretty, pretty well known that the mental health uh, hierarchy, for lack of a better term, across our country is woefully inadequate. We have a number of people who are homeless who are mentally ill. We have uh, a number of veterans who've returned with PTSD. Uh, and we have a number of inmates who are in our facility probably in great part because of acting out because of mental illness. So that is a big problem in this country. And it's a big problem for us to try to um, function within. Um, most of the information that we get from, in, most of the information we have on inmates regarding mental health issues or medical issues are self-reported from uh, the actual detainee. Uh, when they come in, they're booked, we do a pre-medical screening and then a more elaborate, uh, elaborate medical screen, screening is done with our nurse. Um, so most of the information we have regarding any health, uh, health or mental issues come from uh, the inmates themselves or the detainees themselves. Sometimes we get family members who will provide information or call and give us information and sometimes we're able to follow up with treating physicians but many times there are um, individuals within our facility who don't have a common treating physician. Again, though, first and foremost, the detention center 
has to provide for the safe housing of detainees and with the safety of our officers and staff. We are not a hospital and we are limited in what we, uh, the wherewithal that we have within our facility to deal with um, many issues. Um, because of that, we utilize the um, resources that, that many families have to rely upon. We have to rely upon the mental health uh, system uh, in, in everyday life. We have to, um, sometimes the best alternative for us, if we have an inmate who cannot, uh, we can't successfully maintain is if their charges will allow it um, and they wouldn't be a, a danger to the public, we try to get them to tr try to uh, assist them with being bonded out. Um, sometimes that's our best alternative. Um, that wasn't an alternative for either Mr. Waddell or uh, Mr. Gross. Um, as we go through this video, what you're going to see um, is common behavior that our officers deal with every day. Our officers are cursed at, they're spit upon, uh, they have urine and feces thrown on them. It's hard to imagine, but it happens. Uh, it happens very commonly. Uh, inmates will, or, or detainees will um, smear feces and food on the walls. Uh, they have to deal with some detainees who are mild, mildly disruptive and a little bit belligerent, all the way up to individuals who are very combative and self-destructive. Our officers are mooned. Uh, our officers are exposed to genitals by the detainees intentionally. They'll intentionally masturbate in front of the officers, uh, knowing that they can be seen and doing it on purpose. So when our officers come to work every day, not only do they deal with their regular tasks, the responsibilities for counts and moving inmates, making sure they get fed, making sure they get their showers, making sure that all the razors come back in when they're allowed to use razors to, to shave. Um, they also have to deal with these types of issues. That's common for them every day. Um, the use of force is allowed to maintain order and to protect the detainee. It's allowed to uh, protect other inmates or staff and we, by policy, will only use the amount of force necessary to bring the situation under control. When a detainee is actively aggressive, officers are, are taught to use a variety of soft and hard empty hand techniques to gain control or compliance. Officers are also taught that they will repeatedly use those techniques until compliance is gained. Um, as we, as we will um, view on the video later, you will see these techniques used and you will see them immediately cease when compliance is gained. You will also see those same officers begin uh, providing a caretaking role for Mr. Gross, uh, tending to a self-inflicted head injury, cleaning spit from his body where he's been spitting at, spitting at them, and covering and recovering his genitals uh, his genital area to protect his dignity. Um, with that being said, we'll move on to the actual incident at hand. At this time, if everybody could just turn their cameras around, put them on the floor, you can still record the audio. You still have your stuff up here, no problem. But also, please, if you can put your cell phone somewhere where we can see them so you're not using your cell phone to record it. That's all right. I realize um, that that's a very uh, difficult video to watch. Uh, it's, uh, I've been pretty uh, explicit with you uh, in describing the things that we encountered that night and the things that our officers uh, encounter on a routine basis. Um, as we've gone uh, through that video and in discussing our policies and procedures with you um, regarding how much force can be used and when, a, when uh, force is appropriate. I believe we pointed out on the video um, when that force was taken, uh, how quickly it concluded as soon as those officers were able to start gaining control of the situation. Um, it would be very easy uh, to sit here an armchair quarterback. Um, my father always used to say hindsight is 2020. 20. Uh, 
we had the luxury of sitting back and viewing it and as we view it uh, it feels like a lot of times that uh, there's a lot of time passing and I think when you actually look at the time difference between some of these things uh, that were occurring it was uh, in real time for those officers was a much shorter time period than what you're what, what you're experiencing sitting still here so I, I hope you will take all of those things in consideration in um, making judgments regarding what you would have done in that circumstance because uh, I feel real confident in saying that um, with the exception of our detention officers that are in this room, I don't believe there's anybody in this room, me included, who could do the job they do and do it as well as they do. Um, it is totally different from an in enforcement uh, side. Uh, enforcement, they take them into custody, they bring them in, and um, they're not caring for those people's day-to-day uh, -day needs uh, and, re and requirements. And uh, sometimes that care requires that we use force, and, uh, but then more often than not, it requires that we take care of their, their daily needs. And I, and I hope that you've seen uh, some of that in action. Uh, due to uh, the fact that this, uh, the, the other inve investigations are ongoing, uh, we're not gonna sit here and uh, answer questions in an armchair quarterback manner. Um, I believe we've fully answered what was seen on that video. Uh, we believe our, our policy is appropriate. We believe it was followed. Uh, can we take some things from this moving forward? I believe I addressed that um, as we were watching it. We've already talked about um, trying to explore what other kinds of um, devices we might be able to have installed or utilized to, uh, to maintain the location of a restraint chair when someone continues to be combative. Um, and um, we are, as I, as I indicated as well, we've all already had preliminary meetings with um, the officials at Piedmont Hospital. We're exploring p other possible protocols that can be put into place um, to better equip, equip officers and EMS as well in handling uh, inmates that continue to be combative in that nature, uh, to include some medical sedation, those types of things um, as they become available. Uh, so with regard to that incident, uh, our presentation is complete. Now I do want to move forward uh, with uh, a brief comment regarding uh, some allegations that have been made with regard to uh, an inmate, Jeffrey Waddell, who was an inmate here, or detainee in uh, 2006. Uh, Jeffrey Waddell uh, came to us in February of 2006, uh, February 6th of 2006 after he had been arrested by Rock Hill PD. Uh, he was arrested for assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. Um, I believe the victim in that case was uh, a, a relation of his uh, young daughter's mother. Uh, he was also at that same time on probation for uh, assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. Uh, when he came in, the judge denied his bond uh, on the probation matter and so he was um, unable to be bonded out and the judge uh, refused to go forward, I shouldn't say refuse, chose um, not to go forward with the probation violation. He uh, was uh, more desirous of them handling the current charge and the probation matter uh, at the same time. So Mr. Waddell was with us um, from February 6th until um, May the 10th, May the 10th of 2006. Uh, I'm going to comment very carefully on this case uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, there are family members of Mr. Waddell that still miss him very much and um, We have no um, desire to cause them any uh, further anguish. 
However, to be able to respond um, adequately, uh, it does require us to talk about <coughs> some of the behaviors that we're, we were dealing with with Mr. Waddell. Mr. Waddell had been in our facility before, um, and it is true that Mr. Waddell had a seizure disorder. Um, and uh, I state these things because I believe that there is not any kind of a HIPAA violation for me to do so. Uh, I believe his mother has admitted uh, on camera and it has been reported that he had mental health issues and uh, that he had a seizure disorder. Um, as I said, we were aware that Mr. Waddell had a seizure disorder uh, in our facility. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, we gather information like that in a couple of different ways, and or three different ways I mentioned to you, and we had uh, throughout the time periods that we have dealt with Mr. Waddell, not just, not on this uh, in incident alone, we have had uh, discussions with his neurologist. Um, in fact, the, the, the last time he was in our facility, we had discussion, our nurse personnel had discussions with his neurologist. Uh, on a previous incarceration, uh, Mr. Waddell's mother had conversations with uh, our nursing staff. Uh, that was back in 2004. Um, and in addition, we had information from Mr. Waddell that he provided to us himself. So that was the information we were working from with Mr. Waddell. Uh, throughout the time period, uh, well, first let, first let me say that um, the uh, history of his uh, seizures, as is contained in the um, <coughs> autopsy report, was that, uh, and, and also described by the neurologist to our uh, nursing staff, that he had a history of poorly controlled seizures. His seizures were described as atypical clinically by the doctor. Uh, the descriptions that uh, were given were that um, he would appear as awake and alert, uh, he would be very violent, fighting and cursing. Um, these were was the information provided to the nurse by his physician. Uh, during his time period in 2006, those four months that he was with us, or um, three months that he was with us, uh, he had seizures within the detention facility. Uh, typically, um, those those occurred in the facility and he was not transported for those. Uh, he also had a history and, and during this time period refused to take medications. Uh, we have, uh, our records reflect that at some points he would throw the medication down um, the uh, toilet, uh, he would refuse to take, he would pick and choose uh, which medications he wanted to take and which ones he didn't. He also had a history of uh, faking seizures. Uh, he would uh, carry out the same type of behaviors that he would have when he had a, a true seizure. All that to explain uh, what we were dealing with at the time. Um, as I told you earlier, when we have someone who has uh, mental health issues or severe medical issues, uh, our first course of action, if we can, is to get them out of our facility. Uh, we're not equipped to, to manage that and uh, as fully as is necessary in many occasions. So we try to get them out of the facility. That was not an option for Mr. Waddell with regard to bonding him out. Um, however, because he had become so um, unmanageable, uh, we were trying to get him a bed at Just Care, which is a facility, a state-run uh, forensic facility that allows uh, for the, the proper treatment of someone who can't be managed in, in a local jail uh, setting. We sent him to Piedmont 
um, on May 3rd of 2006 to be evaluated for a commitment uh, to that facility. Uh, no bed was available at Just Care at that point, so we could not transport him. Um, on May 10th, we received a phone call from Just Care advising us that a bed was available for Mr. Waddell. Uh, the evaluations that um, for involuntary commitment last 72 hours from the date that they're signed. So it had been uh, seven days. So we had to take him back to Piedmont to have him evaluated so that he could be then uh, transported to Just Care. We took him to Piedmont for that evaluation at around 325 in the afternoon. Uh, during the time period that he was there, he became agitated um, and uh, a, a bit disruptive. And during uh, the time period that they were waiting on all of the uh, testing or whatever was, was, that was taking place, he fell while he was in Piedmont uh, and um, had a small laceration that required a couple of stitches. They gave him uh, those couple of stitches and um, during that process, they communicated with Just Care, the nurse, nurse there at Piedmont. Um, the person that she spoke to, it was after five o'clock, told them they were, she wasn't, that person, I'm not sure if it was male or female, was not uh, aware that a bed was available for Mr. Waddell and they said to call back in the morning. So our officers had to bring, back, bring, bring Mr. Waddell back into our facility uh, to wait for the next day so that we could arrange to transport him then the next morning. It was our intention that we would have gone ahead and transported him that night uh, had there not been a miscommunication between the folks at Just Care. So um, Mr. Waddell was returned to our facility. Um, in route, the officers stopped to check on him and uh, then proceeded on to the jail, uh, the detention facility. Uh, during transport, they uh, notified the, the personnel that he had been combative, uh, been, uh, I, I don't want to use the word combative, that he had been disruptive and had fallen and hit his head um, and asked that there be officers on hand to assist in getting Mr. Waddell out of, out of the uh, van and putting him into a restraint chair. Um, restraint chair uh, was at that point being utilized because of uh, the disruptive nature of what they, they were dealing with that night as well as the fact that he had already injured his head uh, and that uh, we were dealing with someone with a seizure disorder that could injure themselves during the time period that we were trying to make sure we could get him out of the out of the um, van and safely into our facility for a while. Um, that was about, I believe it was about 8.20 when he arrived in our facility. Um, <clears throat> during that time period, he was in the restraint chair. He was in a cell. And um, during that time period, officers uh, had our nurse come and check on him. It appeared that he was, was having some of the same type of seizure, seizures that he had had on occasion, well, had had routinely within our facility. Uh, and officers at that point were of the um, belief, based on what the, the information they had, that um, he would eventually quit seizing. Uh, that, didn't occur, of course, did not occur. Uh, and Mr. Waddell continued to seize um, at approximately 930. Uh, Officers noticed he was not moving, and I do want to back up because in the he was throwing up. Excuse me. Um, he are, was throwing up. Excuse right? me. Excuse me, sir. I'm making my presentation. There will become a time when you. This is the question. Well, there will become a time when I will open it up, and you can ask your questions, and I will answer them as well as I can. All right. Clarify. All right. Well, we will clarify that. In here, three hours. Say three more. But let's calm down.
This press conference is on our dime. It was called for our purposes. We are attempting, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. Are you here to find out the truth or are you here to try to antagonize? We're not gonna be antagonized, sir. We're gonna finish what we're gonna do. You can ask your, you can ask your questions when it's appropriate, okay? Sure. Thank you. All right. Um, during the time period between uh, 8.20 when he arrived back in our facility and 9.30 when it was determined that he was um, no longer moving, there were times when the officers checked on him. There were times when uh, there was at least one time that I recall uh, from my notes that um, Mr. Waddell appeared to be having some um, spittle or liquid coming from his mouth. Uh, officer, we had an officer who went in and um, cleaned his face, uh, checked on him, called the nurse to come back again and take a look at him. It was her assessment that he was having a seizure that he normally has and um, she felt he would come out of it. Uh, as I said, that didn't happen. Uh, Mr. Waddell continued to seize and, um, and he died as a result of continued seizures. Um, as I told you, um, we're, we're not a hospital and we work based on information that's provided to us. Uh, after Mr. Waddell's death, I did some further investigation in his court files and um, I came across a letter that was provided at his probation hearing in 2004. This letter, it was from his neurologist uh, and it is addressed to whom it may concern. It was for the purpose of uh, trying to keep him from being violated on his probation and go back to prison. Um, we were not provided with a copy of this letter. This letter is from 2004 from his neurologist at Mr. Waddell's request. Um, we were also not provided with the information that's in this letter uh, that's particularly interesting um, when, when we were speaking with the doctor. And again, I'm not pointing, I, I want it to be well understood that I am not pointing blame at Mr. Waddell. I am not pointing blame at any doctors. I am simply trying to make sure that you're aware of what information we had, what information we didn't have. This letter to, um, to whom it may concern, please be advised that I am, the, I am the neurologist who has looked after Jeff Waddell. He is a gentleman who has psychiatric and neurological problems. The problem that I am mainly looking after him for is intractable epilepsy. This is a mixture of seizure types that are very hard to control despite a large number of medications and a vagal nerve, vagal nerve stimulator which is, surgically implant, which is a surgically implanted pacemaker to the brain. His seizures sometimes occur on their own but can be definitely triggered by stress. He, in fact, had been doing quite well until he got into this altercation. This would have been the altercation in 2004. Since that time, he has been under a great deal of stress and has had a, had a large flurry of seizures, and his epilepsy has been, again, under very poor control. Jeff has had a hard life with physical and mental abuse and suffers from difficulty with impulse control and anger management. This is well known to the people who know him and it could, easily be, it could easily be predicted that when challenged, he would likely have an aggressive response, especially if someone is, quote, right up in his face, end quote, and is physically aggressive towards him. In addition, when the situation including his child and the fear that he had that his child was being taken away from him uh, served to add fuel to the fire. On the other hand, without physical and aggressive challenge, he is a reasonable individual who has generally stayed out of trouble in recent years. 
It is my professional opinion that if Jeff had to serve jail time that this would adversely affect his health and epilepsy control for the following reasons. The stress of being in jail would be a major trigger for his epilepsy. It could even serve to, stand, to, serve to send him into status epilepticus. What this means is continuous seizures, which is a life-threatening event, possibly to include death. In addition, many of his seizures are grand mal, which are the ones where you fall to the ground and shake all over, bite your tongue, and lose control of bladder. In a jail environment, one could certainly see that this could be dangerous to his physical health. In addition, with his difficult to control epilepsy, he needs to be on a regular routine that he can control. He needs to take his medications on a regular basis, without delay, and he needs to be able to take med uh, medication when he feels a seizure coming on. The latter would be called an aura, and when Jeff gets an aura, he usually puts the magnet over his vagal nerve stimulator or takes a medication to prevent a seizure. Neither of these would be feasible or easily achieved in a jail setting. It is my suggestion that a treatment program focusing on anger management and impulse control could be something that would not only benefit Jeff in the long run, but also serve to prevent this from recurring should he be faced again with a similar situation that required negotiation and compromise and not return uh, of extended physical force. If I can be of any further help or if you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to contact me. This was in September of 2004. We were not made aware of this vagal nerve stimulator in 2004. We were not made aware of it in 2006. Uh, we were not asked whether he could have a magnet that would help him control his seizures. We provided him with his medication as prescribed. He chose not to take his medication. Um, we were not advised of this, this um, epilepsy, uh, sending him into status elep uh, epilepticus, which is exactly um, how he died. Now, granted, um, had we gotten him out of the facility quicker, uh, that would have been a good thing. Uh, again, easy to sit back and armchair quarterback. Given the uh, experience that we had with Mr. Waddell and the knowledge we had at the time, um, again, we did the best we could. Uh, had we had this information, that could have made a difference. Uh, but um, clearly, he should have been out of our facility quicker. Of course, we tried. We tried to get him to Columbia, to a facility that would be better equipped to take care of not only his epilepsy, epilepsy they could have forced medication, uh, but also the mental health issues. They could have forced medication. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Waddell uh, didn't live to get there. And that's something that um, is very difficult for officers to handle. Um, it's not something that we handle very well because they are in our care and we try to do the best we can. Um, as the sheriff has said on numerous occasions, we're not, we're not perfect, we're human. We tried to do the best we could do. Um, the uh, family of Jeff Waddell, uh, the estate of Jeff Waddell sued the sheriff's office on behalf of his young child. Uh, we are covered by the insurance reserve fund. They are, um, they provided defense care. It was their determination that we should try to seek a settlement. They did so. Um, that is something that is uh, although we were aware they were going to try to enter into a settlement, those settlement negotiations take place on behalf of the insurance uh, provider, as does in any type of an insurance case. Um, uh, the changes that we instituted once this occurred is uh, 
any time that anyone has a seizure, they're, tra they're immediately transported. EMS is called, they're transported, period. Um, that took place immediately, uh, pretty much the morning after uh, Ms. Mr. Waddell's death. Uh, they were, uh, our staff was um, told that we don't try to manage that in this, in, in house. We can't, we can't do that. And so that change occurred. Um, and, and I believe, I believe that uh, covers what I wanted to present. So now if you have any questions. Well, I was going to take a time out. I know it's been three hours. Does anybody need to take a restroom break and we'll come back and just want to, just looking out for you real quick. I want to go ahead and knock off some questions. We, we don't. We don't break. intend to go much much yeah. longer. Just want to make sure everybody needs to take a break. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we'll ask a few questions. Question? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it depends, anybody in the depends room. on the question. But yeah. uh, let's try to keep it. Depends on what I want to or not. <laughs> I believe that's the rules here. And, and whether he has the answer or not. Yeah, whether I have the answer or not. Again, a lot of people that work for me. Uh, you know, we have 347 employees here at the sheriff's office, and uh, if I knew everything and could do everything and was everything, I wouldn't need all these employees. So, you know, I, I do have a lot of great staff that's involved, and I want to make a comment. I want to make a comment right now in front of all the cameras. If any of you can show me where we did anything to cause this man's death, I challenge you and you go out and you report it. That man, everything that we did, and I'm going to tell you this, I call it heroic. Folks, we can't control conduct. We deal with it on a daily basis. And we cannot control conduct. But we have our ways and you check don't check with this agency go check with any of the surrounding jails and detention facilities they all use the same type of devices our people are trained you never saw an officer of mine strike this man in the head you didn't see anything that would cause this man's death everything that they did was for, for the purpose of saving this man's life. He was sticking his head in a commode and flushing it. He was hitting his head on the wall. He was out of control. We're not doctors, we're not psychologists, we're not all these things that, that we, that people, some people like to, to think we are. We work with what we got. And no matter what you say, if you look at the time period, we're not talking about a long extended period of time. This man wasn't locked up in this restraint chair for days and days. This was a matter of a few hours. And that being said, I will tell you this, from our internal investigation and what I've been able to determine so far, I've got 42 years in this business. I was a sled agent. I worked jail deaths as a sled agent. And I can tell you this, I have not found any wrongdoing on any officer's part in this organization, on this case or even on the other case. Why did you fire Mike Villione? That is a personnel issue that I think that you, you, Mr. Do, you, do you mind me answering your question? Sure. If you ask me a question, allow me to answer it. Sure. That man was terminated and I think you know the answer. Of all people in this room, you know that answer. But if nobody did anything wrong, any other why'd questions? You fire him? Why'd you fire him? He just tried to bring any, it to public attention. Any other questions? Uh, what about the changes that the lawyer talked about? About you know the restraint chair um, process you can do when people are on suicide watch and things like that. You know, where were you at? Well, you know, we, again, this happened just a few days ago. We're going to look at what we can do with the chair as far as stabilizing that chair. I see a problem, and that's a problem with every restraint chair. You know, somebody that, that's in that restraint chair can make movements and turn the restraint chair over. 
and that was the reason of, of, of trying to, to cinch that, that strap through that door. And we're going to look at, is there a way that we can hook that chair to the floor in some mechanism? But, you know, we, we intend to learn from every incident we have in this facility. We intend to learn from, from, from anything that transpires. Are we perfect? I am not going to stand here and tell you we're perfect like Chris said. I always tell everybody we're human. And we, we, York County Sheriff's Office, York County Detention Facility, we're always looking for ways how we can improve the job that we do. Sheriff, when you saw Officer Moore strike the detainee, when you saw him repeatedly strike him, mm -hmm. is that the state of the art to strike a person to get them into the chair? There, there's, let me say this about the strikes, uh, and I'm not sure whether this was even brought out. From what we can see and what the people around there, and nobody could see like the people that were standing around that chair, Officer Moore's leg was locked between the victim's leg or what, how, what are we stating? Detainee. The detainee's leg. And, yeah, and the, actually the detainee ejaculated on that officer. And he was trying to get the... Uh, the how the, did we know he, that? Uh, does anyone I, mean that we know anything? Any, I, don't, I don't know how to. Answer, I don't quite know how to answer that see question. Clean himself up or anything? We, you we didn't see it on the, on the, on right, there. No, right. you we didn't. didn't but that's okay. Away. But anyway, the, the 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 striking was to get the 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 detainee on up in the chair and to get that officer released. And, that's and that was and that was that was. Uh, I think that was was suitable. By the book. I, I think that was suitable under those conditions. These guys here, I have to answer them whether or not that's by the book because there's steps are, that they are, take. Our use of force is, is reaction. We react to the inmates' combative action. Uh, we work off officer presence, presence, verbal commands, then we go to empty hand control, which we have soft and hard empty hand control, then it moves up to intermediate weapons and deadly full pressure points where that is that's soft empty hand control. Uh, when an inmate is being combative and has a has a officer locked up, which he did with his legs, uh, that is a combative and an act of aggression. So that takes us to hard empty hand control, which is where our strikes come from. So that's where the hand came from. That's where the strikes are. Yes, sir. That so that was by the book. Yes, sir. I believe we fully answered mm -hmm. um, has those officer questions. Has Officer Moore ever been disciplined me. before for? Anybody else have any questions? We're going to take about two more questions. Has Miss, Officer Moore ever been disciplined for striking? I'm, again, him? that's personnel issues. We're not talking about. We're not here to talk about personnel issues. Please interrupt. Please. Interrupt. I, I Please. This is probably a really traumatic event for your officers. Yes, ma'am, it is. What services are being provided to them? Freddie, we're there. We, we have a we have a, a system statewide, and and that's offered to them. I'm not sure exactly where they're at in that, in that process, Fred. Yeah, at this point, I, I spoke with officers involved, and they seem to be doing very well, but if we need to call another system, we can do that to help with you know, situations like this. And all of those officers are back on the job in your same post, or have they been transferred like that? They are, I think everybody's back yes, and, and, and doing doing pretty well. This may be a better question for you guys, but I'm just curious as to how often that restraint chair is used. How it's not uncommon to use the restraint chair four or five times a week. It just varies. Just depends on the type of uh, you know, individuals we have that come in this jail. You know, we deal with all walks of life from you know, your, your trespassing to uh, public disorderly conduct to just like this individual for you know, allegedly charged with murder. And this is Captain, uh, I mean this is Chief uh, Freddie, Arwood. Freddie Arwood, who's the chief over the jail. I know those toxicology results are still pending, but based on y'all's experience, any idea if he may have been on or under the influence of any uh, sort of substance? The only way we'll know that is uh, is when the toxicology is reported. We, we don't have any way of, of knowing that. Is there any way to prevent suicide? Oh, boy. I wish we could. I wish we could go inside the human mind. Uh, you know, suicides are a lot more, 
we have a lot more suicides than we do homicides. And, you know, when somebody is actually hell-bent on destroying their own lives, it's tough to stop. It's tough to stop, you know, and, and the only thing we can do, try to get them to that uh, mental institution or people that it's trained in the mental health business to, to try to deal with them. All right. You've worked with I SLED for a number of years. Do you think SLED will give you a fair shake, or do you think SLED will be more likely to conclude whatever you conclude? Uh, SLED would put their own chief in jail. That's it, Thank everybody. You very much we for appreciate you being here. We appreciate it. If you need any more uh, names and spellings of names, uh, did everybody get the, the picture over there. If you have anything else that you need from me, contact me. I give you my cell phone. I mean, my, um, my cell phone. Just Yes.